So tonight we're going to have a, a topic, it's going to be tech trends from trial to market. And our first speaker is Dr. David Linker. Uh, he's an associate professor in cardiology uh, here at the UW and the adjunct associate professor of bioengineering. Uh, he's an attending physician at the UW, so if you see a cardiologist here, maybe he's your person. He has clinical interests that include general cardiology, congenital heart disease, that means you're born with something wrong with your heart valvular heart disease, and echocardiogram, cardiography. And here he is on top of Mount Adams in Mount St. Helens. Do you guys ever sit down or relax? If you took pictures of me, Edith and I, it would be, we'd be on a couch eating potatoes. <laughs> All right. He's developed an algorithm that is over 50 times more accurate than existing software for screening for atrial fibrillation. Do you guys know what atrial fibrillation is? So your heart is not beating very well. The top half, the bottom half is going okay, but the top half is like this. I'm a GI doctor, so I can say this kind of thing. <laughs> uh, this software that he developed is, uh, it, uh, is inexpensive, and there's a comfortable monitor that you can wear to perform the necessary recordings. Variations of the algorithm can also be used to prevent inappropriate shocks from the implantable defibrillator. And I'm just saying, if you have been inadvertently shocked by your defibrillator, you will not like it. Okay. These technologies led to the launch of a startup company called Cardiac Insight. Okay, here he's waterfall rappelling in Ecuador with his son in Boy Scout troop. Wow. Uh, okay, back to what he has done. He's also developed the software which makes the Seattle heart failure model accessible worldwide on the web and on smartphones. 80 publications, five patents, and numerous other patent disclosures. That's really cool. He earned his medical degree at Stanford, but the bioengineering degree was here at the UW. Go, brother. What I'd like to do is talk to you about some research that has, is heading towards commercialization and present it in two different ways. The first is going to be kind of the elevator pitch, what you would hear if you were a potential investor or somebody interested in buying the technology. And then we're going to take a look under the hood. You'll get an opportunity to understand the actual challenges that occurred along the pathway to commercialization which is a lot more complicated than what you normally hear. So first, just to discuss what is the task that we all have to face, Dr. Mulligan and I, I, I found a quote that I think really s says it very s succinctly. The task is not so much to see what no one ha has yet seen, but to think what nobody has yet thought about that which everybody sees. And this was from Erwin Schrodinger, the famous nuclear physicist. What I'm going to talk about is a new way of approaching a, a very common problem called atrial fibrillation. As you heard earlier, atrial fibrillation is a type of heart rhythm. And we'll di first discuss what it is. On the screen, you can see an electrocardiogram that shows normal sinus rhythm. This is not atrial fibrillation. This is the normal rhythm of the heart on, on an electrocardiogram. You see the large spikes, which are the contraction of the pumping chambers, the ventricles. And then before each spike, you see a little tiny blip, a little, little bump right in front of it. That's the contraction of the receiving chamber, the atria. There's a normal sequence where the atria contract and then the ventricle contracts. That's the normal sinus rhythm. In atrial fibrillation, this type of uh, normal rhythm is completely broken. The atria are no longer contracting regularly. They're actually kind of uh, fluttering in a uh, sort of a, a, what's called a fibrillation, which is kind of like jello, just shaking. And intermittently, the ventricles are 
picking this up and then contracting. So one of the hallmarks of atrial fibrillation is that it's a very irregular rhythm. In fact, it's called an irregularly irregular rhythm. It doesn't have a syncopation like a syncopated beat. In addition, the atria are not contracting, and that means that they are not pushing out the blood in a normal way, and that turns out to be very important. <coughs> atrial fibrillation is the most common treated arrhythmia. It's also often intermittent, so people can go in and out of this rhythm. Many people have this rhythm and are completely unaware of it. So if you happen not to be in the rhythm when you go to see your doctor and don't feel it when you go in and out, you'll have no idea that you have this rhythm problem. The prevalence increases very strongly with age. And the estimate is that the lifetime risk of atrial fibrillation is one in four, meaning by the time you, you, you have reached the end of your life, one in four of us will have had atrial fibrillation at some time or another. The big problem is that it increases the risk of strokes. Because of the lack of the coordinated contraction of the receiving chamber, the atrium, then blood can pool and clots can form. Those clots then can break off and go to your brain, causing a stroke. In addition, the type of stroke that is caused by atrial fibrillation is particularly bad and particularly li likely to cause permanent disability or even death. If you know that somebody has atrial fibrillation, it's possible to give them a treatment that reduces the risk of this clotting and reduces the risk of stroke almost to the same level as if they didn't have atrial fibrillation at all. So clearly, the important point is to try to find people who have atrial fibrillation. Now, how big of a problem is this? In the United States, there are roughly 795,000 strokes every year. Of those, around 600,000 are new strokes, meaning somebody didn't have a known risk for stroke and they all of a sudden had a stroke. About 105,000 of those strokes are in patients who we know have atrial fibrillation and they end up having this complication. Those people are already being treated, and, but there's still that high risk. About 75,000 are due to atrial fibrillation that is not currently being diagnosed before the stroke. In some cases, it is diagnosed after the stroke, but that's too late. And in other cases, based on research studies, it isn't being diagnosed at all. Even after the stroke, the patient happens not to be in atrial fibrillation. But if we do research studies, very detailed research studies, we find out, yes, they are. But no, in normal clinical practice, those people are not being diagnosed. So if we look at the total pie chart of new strokes, Roughly 12% of all new strokes are currently due to atrial fibrillation that is not being diagnosed with the current techniques. So what are the reasons that this is a problem? We need to find the patients with atrial fibrillation before their first stroke. And this can be difficult because they may not have any symptoms. They may have risk factors that we can identify, but then we have to screen them for a prolonged period of time. The current screening techniques usually involve a, what's called an ambulatory monitor. It's generally an electronic device about three to four ounces in, si in, in weight, about the size of a pack of cards. You have to wear it on your belt. You have a bunch of wires hooked up to electrodes on your chest. Patients hate wearing them, and they have to wear them for a day or so. And then you take it back to a lab, download all the data, run it through a computer algorithm, which is not very accurate, and then you have to have a, pay a technician to correct the errors made by the algorithm. And all of that is for a one to two day monitor. So it's not very effective. We need to monitor people for periods of longer than 24 hours. And the monitoring is expensive because of the need of the technician to review the false positives caused by the algorithms. In addition, we need to identify high yield criteria to decide who it is that we should be screening which patients are most likely to benefit from this. So the proposed solution is an automated algorithm with, for very high accuracy screening, not requiring a technician review. So we cut that out of the, the picture completely. And a comfortable, inexpensive hardware for screening so that the people can wear it, be comfortable, go about their daily activities over a prolonged period of time, and also you can do this inexpensively. I like to say that this is a monitor for this century, and the, the technology we have is the technology from last century. 
So what I developed was what I call the stealth monitor. And the reason it's called stealth is when I thought about the current monitors and how clunky they were, I thought, what if the monitor disappears completely? You can't see it. The only way it can disappear, you still have to have electrodes attached to the chest. So that means if all you have is the electrodes left on the chest, the monitor box has disappeared. It's invisible. And so I called it the stealth device. This is an actual prototype of the stealth device, a functioning prototype, and you can see its size. It's a seven-day monitor with a single lead. The whole housing is flexible, so it can, it can bend with your body motions, so it's completely flexible. The white is actually a foam flexible housing. It's four <coughs> inches by 1.24 inches and only one quarter ounce in weight. The data is actually analyzed on the device as it's being recorded so that it doesn't require downloading of all the data before it gets analyzed. It's very inexpensive to produ produce and it also records everything so that if a cardiologist wants to examine the rhythm, the actual recordings to say, do I agree with what the computer algorithm said, everything is there to be reviewed. So there's nothing that's thrown away. This has already been uh, gone through the FDA clearance process, and this was the subject of the startup company, Cardiac Insight, which has helped me develop this. So all of this looks great, and we're, it's a great, nice little package. You have, here's the problem, here's the solution, here's the commercialization. Everything's very easy, right? Not at all. Now let's look under the hood as to what the real background story was, not the elevator pitch. So how did this idea start? What was the initial plan? What was the initial response? How did that plan look at modified? And what sort of funding was critical along the way? So the initial idea started back in 2004 with a conversation with one of my colleagues who's an electrophysiologist who deals with atrial fibrillation. He said, gee, are there any algorithms that can detect automatically detect atrial fibrillation, because I'm really interested in trying to find patients who don't know that they have the symptoms. And so I started looking and discovered that there were a bunch of algorithms, computer programs to detect atrial fibrillation. The problem was that they were very inaccurate. If you gave them a piece of electrocardiogram, 5% of the time, 3 to 5% of the time, they would say it was atrial fibrillation when it wasn't atrial fibrillation at all. And if you do a seven-day recording on somebody, that means that everybody in this room would be labeled as having atrial fibrillation, 100%. And the only way you'd find out who really had it was you'd have to pay a technician to review all the errors by the algorithm. So I thought, this, this can't be the best that is, there is. There must be a better way of doing it, even though people have been spending decades trying to get atrial fibrillation detection algorithms. So I went back to the original research on the fundamental mathematics of, of uh, atrial fibrillation. And then using that fundamental mathematics of what characterizes atrial fibrillation as distinguished from normal rhythm, uh, developed some, some computer programs that were able to detect atrial fibrillation. And this was, the results were quite frankly spectacular. Compared to the false positive rate of three to five percent in the existing algorithms, my false positive rate was 0.04%. And that was on the initial algorithm. There have been further developments since then that further improved it. And what that means in practical terms is that you can record from normal people and the algorithm will say you're normal. You don't have atrial fibrillation. Whereas all the other algorithms will say everybody has atrial fibrillation and you'll have to pay a technician to prove that the algorithm, when the algorithm was right and when it was wrong. So all of a sudden, you've reduced the cost of screening dramatically because you no longer have to be paying the technician to do the, the, the correction of the, the algorithm. It's also extremely low computational co complexity, which means it's possible to put it into a tiny, tiny microcontroller chip that you don't have to have a big desktop computer or a supercomputer to analyze. There are actually algorithms out there that, that use kind of a supercomputer to compare and, and mix and match, obviously very expensive. So my first thought was, gee, this is a great algorithm. This is going to be very useful for the companies that want to do this. And I don't want to start a company. I'm, I don't do my research. I want to take care of patients and do research. So this is a licensing opportunity. 
So I'll go and talk to these companies and they'll just snap it up. They'll say, gee, this is a great idea. So the question is, how do you do this? Obviously, you can't do that right away because there's all this, these issues about what's called intellectual property. You know, there's worry that if you go to people and tell them your idea, they'll steal it. So first you have to start figuring out how do I patent this, how do I approach different companies. And the problem is that business perception of value is very different from the academic perception of value. What we think of as, as valuable and useful in, in, in medicine and research is not necessarily what they think of as value and, and useful in the business world. In addition, they use a different language, often the same words, but they mean different things. And they're different customs. So I felt kind of like I needed to be an anthropologist. I needed to go explore this different culture. I needed to take notes and learn what, what these people were thinking and what they meant by these words they were using. And I was going to be going into some different territories that I'd never been in. So I needed a guide, an explorer, that would help lead the way, <laughs> that would show me where I was going to go. And maybe sometimes I needed somebody who was willing to help defend me and fight in my corner, kind of like Indiana Jones. So what I did was I went to what used to be called technology transfer and now is called the C4C or Center for Commercialization and found these partners and guides who helped in me in my anthropological study of this new world, this new culture of business. So at the Center for Commercialization, they have technology managers. And I've had many that have worked on this. The one who's worked most with me is Laura Dorsey and a patent manager, Jessica Myers, and a business partner who is outside of the university who's helped me with this as well. So Laura has been extremely helpful in terms of understanding where do I go? What's my next step? How do I, what, what do I do in terms of intellectual property? What do I do in terms of patents? Uh, what do I do in terms of approaching different companies? When should I approach different companies? What should I be talking to them about? Jessica is a, a lawyer who's been extraordinarily helpful in terms of, of mapping a patent strategy, an intellectual property strategy, saying what is the intellectual property here that we can protect? How can we get a patent? How should we strategize this so that we're not spending too much money on the patents? And Brad Harlow is an experienced entrepreneur in the space of rhythm management and rhythm diagnosis and has been extraordinarily helpful in terms of helping me contact people in the business community, understanding where the value added is from a business perspective. So what were the initial steps? We filed some patents based on the technology that I developed, which have since been granted. Uh, there are new developments since then that are still in process. And Brad Harlow helped me make meetings with CEOs of various monitoring companies. Up until this point, the fundraising that was necessary for this project was zero, which is good. Now, that doesn't mean there wasn't, weren't any expenses because the patents are very expensive, but the university bore that expense and then later gets reimbursed as this becomes commercialized. In addition, I'd had travel expenses. I was, fortunately, I was going to the conferences where I would meet these CEOs anyway for scientific reasons to make presentations and then I would just make arrangements to meet them at the same time. So what do you think the result was of this initial great idea going out saying this is a fantastic opportunity for you to make money and it costs you almost nothing? Nada. <laughs> Not a nibble by any of the companies. So that caused me to sort of rethink things. I, I tried to look at it from a business person's perspective because to me this was a no-brainer. It was kind of like here you just change some software and you got all of a sudden have a market advantage and, and it's good for patients, it's good for doctors, it's good for technicians. What's not to like about that? Well, I realized the business view of the world is very different. And I have, fortunately I was able to get a picture of the business view of the world. <laughs> and what you can see is that there's the known land which has all sorts of hazards of mountains and rivers and even volcanoes. But it's even worse out in the ocean. There are monsters out there. So that is change from the point of view of a business person. The change is incredibly risky and incredibly scary. So then I realized that one of the tasks I needed to do 
was to reduce the perceived risk from the point of view of the business people. Because they viewed this as just prohibitive risk. And so I, how could I reduce the risk? Well, I thought, well, if I can create hardware that has my software in it and show them that it's possible and show them that it all works, that will reduce the risk. And so I applied for some internal risk reduction funding here at the university. And this was the Technology Gap Innovation Funding called TGIF through C4C. It's now changed name, I think it's called uh, um, Commercialization Gap Funding, CGF. And this was about $50,000 that allowed me to develop an actual functioning prototype of a new monitor, realizing that the existing monitors are about three uh, to four ounces and record for 24 hours. What I did was make a one ounce monitor that recorded for a month, at the same time as having just as high quality as existing devices and very low production costs. So this is an actual photograph of that initial prototype. You can actually see it says AFD 0.1, so atrial fibrillation detection 0.1, University of Washington. And that was the first functioning prototype, very similar in size to a quarter. The next step was to reduce the risk more by producing a slicker prototype with hardware improvements. So this one kind of looked like a lab bench prototype. I wanted something that actually looked almost like a commercial product. And I wanted it to be, this one was a single channel, just two electrodes. And at the time I thought that people wanted a two channel recorder. And I wanted it to have a housing and to look like it could potentially could be put on, on subjects. So at this time, um, and also I wanted to improve the signal quality. This time I sought some gift funds from the Washington Research Foundation Capital, which is a venture capital group that is dedicated to helping commercialize intellectual property from the University of Washington. And uh, Luciana Simoncini was very helpful there. Uh, that was around $30,000, but it was a gift. And that's very important because a grant, even the other grant, I say what I'm going to do and I have to do exactly what I said I was going to do. A gift is unrestricted. So I can say I'm planning to use it for this, but then if I have money left over, I can use it for something else. And I can continue, it turned out that this gift was very, very important for, to keeping this project alive. So that's thanks to Luciana. And the result was this prototype. And it looks a lot slicker. It's got a logo, it's got a, a name. I called it the Endurance Full Disclosure Device. Um, a nice Husky, I kind of like the, the UW Husky. Uh, copyright 2007, University of Washington, designed and developed by David Linker. So it, it looks a lot more professional, and it actually was able, it, it was something that I could put on a subject if I wanted to, and I could show to various companies. At the same time, I applied to the NIH, the National Institute of Health, for what's called a, a, a technology development, small business technology development grant to further validate the software and hardware changes. This was about $160,000. And I was able to demonstrate that the algorithm was superior to any algorithms that the competition had by a wide margin, including resistance to poor signal quality. So if the signal quality was poor, the algorithm still did better than all the other ones. The, Hardware was also superior, not only in terms of size, cost of production, but also the signal quality was superior in terms of reducing artifact. And that's illustrated here, where you can see the, the upper row is a standard uh, type of monitor where somebody is just sitting quietly, they're jogging or jumping, and you can see the artifact. And with the modified hardware that I developed, then there's much reduced artifact when they're moving. So what's not to like about this? So in 2006 to 2008, I approached various companies with a hardware software combination for licensing. The software was much more accurate than existing software, reducing technician costs. The hardware outperforms their existing hardware and costs less to produce. I'd done my homework on how much it cost them to produce their devices and I knew how much it would cost to produce mine. So I thought, you know, they say, build a better mousetrap and the world will be beat a path to your door. I've got a better mousetrap. The result? Anybody want to guess? <laughs> Nada. No interest at all. So, again, I had to think about uh, what's going on here. And 
fortunately, it's, there are other people who've thought about this as well, and there are some business myths. One of the business myths is build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. And in a book about myth, myths of, of uh, in innovation, there's the following quote, the world's most common reaction to a new idea is to beat down the idea or perhaps worse, ignore it. So that's the normal response to a new innovative idea. That's actually from The Myths of Creativity by David Berkus. So why is this? What, what is the reason behind this? It, this is counterintuitive, this is against what all of our mythology is, and I found the, the, the reason in another book. And this was called Beyond the Idea by uh, Govindarajan and Trimble. And they had a chapter title that says it all. Organizations are not built to execute innovation. That's the chapter title of one of the chapters in their book. And what they explain in the book is that business is built on the performance engine, which is based on repeatability and predictability. And that innovation is by definition non-routine and uncertain. So by definition, business is opposed to innovation. That's one of the problems. So going back, putting on my thinking cap and talking to my, my guides, we decided that the best approach was actually to create a company, to create a startup, and that was the way to move forward. So I spoke with the C4C entrepreneur in residence, Tom Clement, and he advised me to make the pitch in various forums and to learn the differences between a business pitch and an academic presentation. And this is Tom Clement. One of the things that I learned very early on in, in this process is the business pitch and the academic pitch are radically different. In the, the academic pitch, it's all about the data. In the business pitch, you start out by selling yourself. In an academic pitch, you, you're supposed to disappear. I don't tell you about my background or anything like that. In a business pitch, you start out saying, here's my background, here's, here are my qualifications, all these things. In the business pitch, you end with projected income over the next five years. The first time I was asked to do that, I said, well, that's just speculation. That's fabrication. Well, in the business world, you're expected to do that. If you don't do that, it's something missing from your presentation. In the, in the academic world, if you do that, that's fraud. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so a slight, slight differences in terms of the cultures. I mean, oh, actually, that's a little bit judgmental. That's my answer, my, going from my culture, speaking about another culture, I'm, I'm sorry about being judgmental. So, now, to give you an idea of the climate when this was going on, this is the, the track of medical device investment from 2001 to 2009, just when I was making my pitch. Perfect timing, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> that the investment was down 61% from 2008 to 2009, and down 76% from 2001 to 2009. So this was not the best opportunity in terms of timing uh, investments. Now, I first gave some presentations at the Technology Alliance Innovation Showcase, and this was actually a series of competitions. So they had a bunch of presentations, and then they picked the ones they thought were best, and then they would have you come back and then have another set of competitions. But the, one of the advantages was that between those uh, presentations, if you made it through the first round, they gave you coaching on business presentations. So they talked to you and said, Oh, well, you know, your last presentation was really interesting, but it was a, an academic presentation. You need to give a business presentation. So the first slide should be talking about yourself. <laughs> and here's what you should say about yourself, and things like that. And, and then you need to have the projected income over the first five years in the last slide. And we'll help you sort of make, fabricate something there. So uh, um, I made it through all of the rounds until the very last round, just for the last round. And there, it was very interesting, they were they said, well, we don't want you to go to the next round because when you're projecting how much your company is going to be worth in, uh, in five years, you're projecting 15 to $20 million, and that's much too low. We're just not interested in that. I go, whoa, you know, as an uh, academic cardiologist, 15 to $20 million is a lot of money. <laughs> but obviously in this world, that's, that's, that's meaningless. So did not make it. Then presented to Wings, uh, the Washington Medical Technology uh, Angel Network, a series of rounds of presentations. Some of the same people were in that group, 
and they were saying, we can almost give the presentation ourselves because we've heard it so many times now. <laughs> um, and the final round was in pro pro uh, potential investors who then invested in the company. And this is the Wings logo. There are other similar groups of angel investors. There's Angel MB, which is a new group. I also applied for funds from the Life Science Discovery Fund, which was a Washington State uh, fund that was originally funded by the tobacco settlement money, aimed at bettering health in Washington State and supporting local commercialization of Washington research. Have gotten $150,000 for a screening study in King County, the, the so-called SAFE study, screening for asymptomatic atrial fibrillation events. The screening tool has been developed and enrollment is underway. When we look at the funding over time, then you can see that the, there's a little bit of funding early on in terms of grants and then a gap, and then we have investment coming in later on and more funding. This is actually typical for technology. And in particular, this unrestricted gift funding early on, especially the WRF capital, is critical to d develop uh, technologies like this. To show you what's happened since then, investors have been coming in, and you can see the very large increase in investment, which is outside investment that's coming into the, the, the project so that it's well on its way towards reaching the, the, the commercial marketplace and clinical practice. A few parting thoughts. This is also from The Myths of Creativity by David Burkus. It's not enough for people to learn how to be more creative. They also need to be persistent through the rejection they might face. So now you have an idea of how much rejection you have to face to make this, these th types of things fly. Another quote is small grants and gifts early in the process are critical to the success of an idea and have a huge societal return on investment. That's a quote from me today. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank all of the guides that helped me along this process and to quote the, the Beatles, I get by with a little help from my friends. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>